take off lane. You keep it up, you make it feel like a play. Yo, my cardio is infinite. <laughs> Big Willie Styles all in it. Get the jiggy with it. All right, welcome. Um, good, let's make sure I'm unmuted here, great. Um, we'll go ahead and get underway for today's Zoom. I am recording as I put in the chat uh, and I'll make this available to everyone in the honor section as well as in the large sections, uh, there will be a reference. Um, also, um, let's see, I think we'll just uh, get underway. I've uh, created a module D on the law of ideas I've also put in a set of slides in there, as well as an intellectual property primer or introduction, basic overview. Uh, this All this corresponds also with chapter 24 in the textbook for the honor student sections. I'll go ahead and provide you that chapter. Um, let's get underway. What I'm going to do, though, is just um, I want to begin really by talking about um, Facebook and uh, as an example of IP. I have, uh, here's what I'll do. Let me do a screen share and show you, um, let's see here. Let me see if I can get into here. Uh, all right. Oh, hold on, hold on one second. I uh, I think I need to pull up the, uh, the document. Okay, great. I just wanna show you the homepage, Facebook's homepage uh, when it was launched. Uh, um, on February 4th of 2004. And uh, just as a, as a reference point here. All right, great. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to minimize my video screen. And as you can see, I have a bunch of screens uh, open here. Uh, hopefully, by the way, if, if our system crashes, just stay on the line. I have a backup device. I can uh, reestablish uh, the connection. Uh, but here, what I want to do is just show everyone the uh, homepage of the Facebook when it was launched. And uh, let's see if I go into here and expand it. Um, you can see um, it's one of the things I like about the movie. Jesse Eisenberg, who plays the character of Mark Zuckerberg, talks about he has this idea for a clean and simple website. Now, I put in module D and I may have shown the class previously um, what the Harvard connection looked like. Uh, uh, so you can compare the Facebook with the Harvard connection and you can see 
Uh, there are some real significant differences, uh, but you see it's a really clean and simple website. Uh, one of the things I wanna bring to your attention is the uh, uh, copyright logo here on the bottom. Uh, we're going to see, uh, we've actually already seen with the Winklevoss complaint, the allegations of trade secret theft, the source code that goes into a a website or a computer program or an app, for example, if you have an idea for an app, uh, the computer program could be uh, or the source code for that app or the program could very well be a trade secret. Um, also, it might be subject to copyright protection, as we'll see. And there's also I'll, I'll talk about Google and patents and um, just to round out our discussion of uh, intellectual property uh, and, and not to be forgotten our trademarks. Right, like like Facebook or the Facebook like, what can you know the like symbol? Um, what can you and can you not trademark? And so, uh, what's really cool about this you know website, I, as it uh, this interface uh, when the Facebook was launched from Zuckerberg's dorm room, uh, the Sweet H thirty three Kirkland House, um, you can see that. Uh, it's a really clean and simple website. You know, all the basic features are there and um, uh, you can compare this to Google. In fact, what I wanna do is, let me actually end the screen share. You've seen this. Um, by the way, if you go into the slides, let me just share with you a couple of things. You'll see I've created here sort of a big picture of what, you'll, of what we're gonna talk about, not necessarily in this order, but when we say um, intellectual property rights, or I prefer the law of ideas, what I'm really referring to are these four areas of law um, that we're going to be exploring in today's class and uh, or just presenting. Again, this will be a, just an overview. Um, also, what I've done and you can keep going is you can see that um, the various, for example, a, uh, intellectual property aspects of the Facebook, you know, um, and this is. Uh, 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 as you can see, the relevance of all this. Although I'm going to talk a little more about Google and Apple and some other big tech companies uh, in addition to Facebook, just to mix it up a little bit. Um, so here's what I want to do. Let me do this. Uh, let me do a uh, screen share. What I want to share with you in the modules is there is an article from the Harvard Crimson uh, talking about the um, the you know the launching of Facebook and why students are signing up for it. Um, there's also a video clip in there, Peter Thiel explaining why he invested in the Facebook. Um, after Eduardo Saverin, uh, Peter Thiel is gonna be the first outside investor or angel investor in Facebook. And, and we'll see more about Peter Thiel uh, in the next class because he's going to make uh, as a condition of his investment when he gives uh, Mark Zuckerberg, $500,000, he's going to say, uh, but I'm going to need you to create a Delaware corporation, or we're going to create a Delaware corporation, and then we're going to squeeze Eduardo out, uh, we're going to dilute him eventually. So uh, we'll take a, a, a closer look at that, uh, at that in the next module. Uh, but, but in, you know, that initial decision, and I got to tell you, $500,000, right? I, you know, I was, for example, I was watching uh, Shark Tank, I think, was it Saturday night? Um, and uh, the new episode, I thought it was a really good episode, but I noticed everybody's coming in asking for $200,000, you know? And so here comes, um, here comes Peter Thiel, you know, willing to give $500,000. Uh, so it's a pretty significant uh, uh, angel investment. Uh, but let's talk about intellectual property. And one thing that I want you to see is to understand why Peter Thiel invested in Facebook is I wanna show you one of the links I have included in the module, uh, module D. So let me go ahead and do a screen share. And uh, let's see here, this should be up and ready to go. What did the internet look like in the early 2000s? Now, I show you this, if you get this, if Canvas doesn't wanna open up the website, I've already vetted this, you know, uh, just go ahead and click on it and then uh, you'll see it. It'll just take you to the, directly to it. And this is just an example. Um, you can see what the web looked like. This is around, um, I think YouTube was founded in 2005 or launched in 2005. And uh, this is really what it looked like back then. Uh, eBay, I, I think that also is, um, you know, mid 90s. You can see what eBay looked like. Um, Apple, um, see what Apple looked like uh, back then. 
Um, look at the original Google, which I'll talk more about, you know, uh, the original Google with, you know, there's an explanation point there, like, uh, like the original Yahoo. Um, you can see that, you know, if you were to go to like Google, and I know most of you, if not all of you use Google, maybe like me on a daily basis, you know, um, sometimes we don't even go to the Google homepage anymore. We just type the search uh, query in our, uh, uh, in this box, uh, you know, but if you do go on the Google page, uh, why don't we go to the Google page right now? Um, you'll see, right, it's a lot different. It's a lot more clean and simple. You know, it kind of looks a lot like that original Facebook page, really clean and simple. When you look at that original Facebook page from the beginning of 2004, you see it's really anticipating this movement towards, you know, clean and simple internet. Let's go to Apple's homepage. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, you could compare it to, uh, you know, what you saw, uh, you know, in the early 2000s. Um, you know, a lot more clean and simple. There's now no external advertising, you know, it's just all about Apple and Apple products and it's a lot more sleek. And that's what you'll basically see um, in all of these uh, websites. Um, if we go back here, by the way, I mean, it is kind of fun to look at what the web looked like back in, uh, you know, the early 2000s or when these websites were launched, mid 2000s, uh, late 1990s. Um, now it's taking a little bit of time to load, but you go in there and you'll see, um, remember these were the, these were the big, uh, uh, companies at the time, you know, and you can see, uh, the differences between, uh, back then and now, um, uh, look at Microsoft's website, um, Amazon's website when it was founded in the mid nineties. Uh, AOL, you know, this was like the first big, uh, this is how a lot of people got their introduction to the website, uh, to the internet, uh, World Wide Web. And the basic idea is that, you know, one of the thing common denom denominators here that you'll see um, with the web back then and the web today is just like a lot of clutter, you know, just a lot of clutter. Um, uh, whereas today, like the top websites like Apple, Facebook, you know, more clean and simple. Um, so, and a lot, you know, it was Zuckerberg and of course Google to usher in uh, those um, changes. One of the things I want to show you is uh, if I go back here into the modules, um, there's a great clip here, uh, Peter Thiel, and I uh, just want to show you in his own words why he invested in Facebook. I'll show maybe the first 60 seconds of this clip that really uh, explain why he invested in Facebook. How can you spot a winner as, as big as Zuckerberg? Well, it's, um, it, would, it probably would be somewhat misleading to say that uh, all of this could be, could be seen, uh, seen from the from the very beginning. Um, I had looked at already a number of these uh, different social networking sites, and there were definitely a lot of the early attributes were quite good. They seemed very competent technically, which is actually um, strangely not true of many of the other companies. But I think one of the other, uh, one of the other things to always uh, focus, that I, I'm always very focused on this point, is not just the product or the, the, the abilities of the people, but, um, but sort of the third part is what I would describe as the business model the business strategy. And I think that's often um, not given enough weight uh, because um, you know, inventing something, something new uh, is generally good for the world. It doesn't mean that you automatically will do well as, a, as an inventor. In fact, most scientists and inventors end up uh, doing disturbingly, capturing disturbingly little of the value you create. You know, to succeed as an inventor or a scientist or entrepreneur, you have to create X dollars of value for the world and you have to capture Y percent of X. I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to submit to you that's probably the most important thing, uh, idea, uh, concept. Um, I think you'll learn in in this course, maybe even in your entire, uh, you know, I'm a little bit presumptuous. I'm sounding here a little bit like Peter Thiel, but maybe in your entire, you know, a business college, uh, a business uh, degree. Uh, what Peter Thiel is saying is to be successful in business, whether you're an entrepreneur, a small business firm, medium size, or you know one of these 
big players like Amazon and Google, you have to have first and foremost, think of Shark Tank. You have to have a good idea, what he's calling the X variable, right? You have to have an idea for a product or service that people are going to want to buy or people are going to want to use, you know? But here's the key. Here's the key idea that we already knew. And that's really hard to come up with a good idea that no one else has come up with. But Peter Thiel's making a deeper and more important point. In addition to that, you also have to figure out a way of, and I'll quote, you know, say what he said verbatim, the why variable, capturing some of the value of your idea for yourself. And that why variable is going to be what we're going to talk about today, intellectual property law, or what I prefer to call the law of ideas. Up to now, what we've seen when we were looking at law, whether it's like that first unit constitutional law, which is basically setting up the rules for government and um, also you know, a, a set of basic rights like free speech rights, um, or like what we saw in module B sources of law, we looked at like cyber criminal law um, and then module uh, uh, C, we looked at the common law. We've been, basically been looking at rules for legal liability what not to do, how to avoid getting into you know, legal liability trouble. What intellectual property law does is it actually allows you to not just avoid trouble. Okay, what do I need to do to avoid infringing other people's intellectual property? Yeah, it does that. But more importantly, there's a positive aspect to this. And I mean positive in the literal sense that intellectual property law is how entrepreneurs and companies are able to, if they can come up with a good X, a good idea for a product or service, it's how they can capture the value. Okay, how do I protect my idea? How do I brand my idea, trademark it? How can I copyright the expression of my idea? So that's why intellectual property law is so important. To me, I would argue it's probably, you know, Business law, it's all important, you know, labor law and the common law, you know, criminal law, uh, constitutional law, but IP law or the law of ideas is from, it's kind of the practical side. Okay, how do I, how can I profit from my idea? How can I, you know, how can I protect my idea legally speaking uh, so that if anybody does infringe upon it or wants to use it, they have to come to me, you know, and if they don't come to me, I can sue them and collect damages and get the courts on my side. So these are really, really, I can't, I can't overestimate enough, you know, how important this area of law is. So with that said, let's start with patent. I want to show you Google's very first patent, because I think when we talk about the law of ideas, a lot of people are thinking, okay, an invention, a patent. You know, that's probably what comes to a lot of people's minds. So let me um, let me go ahead and back into the screen share. And what I'm going to do here is just go back into module D and uh, 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 just pull it up really quick. All right, let's look at the let's look at Google's first patent. And uh, we'll let it load a little bit. Already. Maybe we can zoom this somewhat. Um, one of the things I want to show you here is this the top left corner. Um, this patent is for a method for ranking in a linked database, otherwise known as the page rank search algorithm that Google was based on. You'll see here the inventors, Lawrence Page, Larry Page. Um, later on, him and a fellow student, Sergey Brin are going to found their company. But at the time that they got the patent, right, they were students at Stanford. And so notice the assignee, that is to say, to whom the rights to the patent are assigned, it's going to be Stanford University. And this is something you got to be aware of. Like if you're a student or you work at a company and you come up with an idea under the so called it's a common law work for hire doctrine, um, and probably under your whatever contractual uh, you know, contract uh, you may have um, uh, with your uh, employer, probably you're going to have to assign your rights to the employer, you know. Now, that you can switch out. Contracts can say different things, you know. Uh, in this case, I can tell you what happened is 
Uh, Stanford is very cutting edge, their business school and their computer science and all that. And so when Larry Page and Sergey Brin graduated, uh, what happened was uh, Stanford uh, assigned the patent back to them in exchange for a royalty or in exchange for a slice of any profits from the founding of their company. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is like just, you know, and you can look at this patent at your own leisure, but you can see it's a very technical looking document. In fact, it looks very much like a scientific paper uh, with an abstract, which is kind of a summary, um, a literature review, other publications, um, a drawing here uh, showing how the page rank algorithm works. I won't go into all the technical details, but just to let you know that um, in addition to, let's say, a keyword search, you know, let's say you're searching for um, like uh, pizza, you know, or something like that. And so you put pizza in the Google search engine or in any search engine, right? So one thing is, okay, you want to look, you want web pages maybe that have the word pizza in it, right? Or pizzeria or whatever. But also what the page rank algorithm does is, okay, how many other websites um, link to that pizzeria's website? And so the idea with the, the original idea with page rank algorithm is that the more other people's websites are linking to your website, the more your website is going to be higher up in the page rank algorithm, you know, on the search page results, uh, because other people are, you know, basically linking to your website. That is a proxy for, you know, relevance. And so uh, this is sort of the first step in the Google, um, you know, innovation and improvement of uh, uh, of the of search of search internet search. But the really the the real thing I want to focus on here for you is up on top. It's um, you, if you recall here, it says that this application was filed on January 9, 1998, which is when Google started up. Um, look when the patent was granted, September 4th, 2001. You know, what does that tell you? Just looking at that, we're talking about a three and three quarter year turnover for perhaps one of the most important patents, you know, maybe next to the light bulb, right? Ever filed with the United States, uh, you know, trademark and patent office. What it tells you is what I'm about to tell you is that getting a patent is very not just expensive and that you're going to need a patent lawyer to help you. You saw how you saw how formal the patent application is and what a patent looks like. Um, you also um, it's also very expensive. It takes a lot of time. The patent office is probably the most the most difficult and time consuming and expensive of the four forms of in, of intellectual property, uh, because even Google. Even Larry Page, it took him over almost four years, right, to get his page rank algorithm. Now, why is it so hard to get a patent? Because you're going to have to show, uh, to get a patent, you're going to have to prove three things. There's three elements to getting a patent. Um, one is your patent has to be new. It's going to be a new idea. You know, um, nobody else has filed it before. Number two, it's got to be useful. You know, it's got to be something that, um, people can use and get value from. And thirdly, and I would argue the most difficult of the elements to prove is your patent, your invention, your idea has to be non-obvious. That is to say, given the prior art, that's the fancy word in patent law for the existing state of knowledge uh, when you file your um, patent application, your patent registration, um, that it was not obvious, you know, your invention was not obvious coming up with it. So it's not enough that it's new and useful. It has to be non-obvious. And that, I've got to be honest with you, is probably the most difficult uh, element to establish when it comes to a patent. Because if Larry Page can come up with it, you know, if he came up with the idea with the help of Sergey Brin, right? Um, how can it be non-obvious? I mean, he, he came up with it at some point in time, you know, so the idea had to be, at some point it becomes, right, it becomes clear, you know, that there's a better way of doing a, a search uh, engine algorithm, right? But, um, so th that's really difficult. It's probably the main reason why a lot of these applications take so long, establishing the non-obvious in, in this uh, element. But anyways, that gives you a good summary of um, patents. One of the interesting thing is, and I'm not going to spend any more time on patent law, though 
um, it's important, um, but I'm not gonna spend any more time is because after that initial patent, try doing a search for other Google patents and you're not, uh, you're not gonna find any, or you're gonna find very few, at least you're gonna, not gonna find any with respect to Google search. One of the interesting things about Google is that after Larry Page and Sergey Brin left uh, Stanford and set up their own company and decided to go public, you know, and brought in Eric Schmidt as their CEO. Um, one of the interesting things is that now Google, for example, now if you type in the word pizza, before, back in the day, all you would get is the top 10 links of, you know, pizzerias, right? But now because of GPS and because of all these innovations that Google has done to its page rank algorithm, now when you search for pizza, very likely a map is gonna pop up with a bunch of different you know, pizzerias that are near to you. And even with reviews of those pizzerias, opening hours and all kinds of useful information. And then you'll get a few links after that. you know. And so um, all of these innovations that Google has done to its page rank algorithm now Google pretty much just goes with trade secret protection rather than patent. One of the reasons why is if you go back to that patent I just showed you and you saw that it was approved on, I believe it was September 9th, uh, 2001, um, that patent right is going to expire. It's a 20 year term. It's going to expire in September of this year, right? So that means anybody then could then use the ideas in the patent you know, freely. Whereas trade secret protection lasts indefinitely. And with trade secret protection, there is no registration requirements. You're not required to disclose. In fact, quite the contrary. Um, trade secrets are protected by common law. And so, you know, it is state law in each of the 50 states. Or if you go to England, you know, United Kingdom, uh, you go to some of the other common law countries, what is the judge made law of? Um, of trade secrets in those, in those countries, there may be a statute. There is something, for example, called the Uniform Trade Secret Act um, that was um, drafted by the American Law Institute, which is a model trade secret law. I believe some 42 or so states have adopted the Uniform Trade Secret Act, but that uh, US uh, UTSA is based on pure common law principles. Also at the time in 2003, in Massachusetts, right, when uh, 2000, 2003, 2004, when Zuckerberg either stole the idea for Facebook or came with it, came up with it by himself, um, uh, th there was no Uniform Trade Secret Act in Massachusetts, it was pure common law. And the common law says that in order to have a trade secret, there's no registration. You have to comply with two, you have to establish two elements. One is you have to have an idea that's commercially valuable. You have to have an idea. This is very similar to kind of the usefulness requirement in patent law, but in trade secret law, we talk about, you know, it has to have value, commercial value. Basically, it's got to be something that's worth stealing or something that people might be willing to pay money for. Um, but number two, and this is going to be critical to the Winklevoss lawsuit that we saw in the previous module. Number two, the owner of the trade secret has to take reasonable steps or reasonable efforts in order to keep his idea or her idea a secret, or in the case of a company, its idea, its trade secret ideas a secret. So um, I have to tell you, um, you know, trade secret law is very versatile. Basically today, the Google search engine algorithm, it's mostly protected by trade secret law, you know? Uh, and so that means Sergey, uh, you know, uh, Brin and Larry Page, you know, Google Alphabet Inc they're going to have to, you know, their idea is definitely commercially valuable, right? And they're going to have to take uh, steps, reasonable efforts to keep their idea a secret. Now, before we explain what that is and how that you know, applies to the Winklevoss lawsuit, um, it's not just the Google search rank algorithm, perhaps the most famous trade secret is the Coca-Cola formula, you know, but really almost all products embody ideas and a lot of these ideas are protected by trade secret law, common law, trade secret law, um, as opposed to patents, because patents are so expensive and time consuming to obtain, and they expire after 20 years. So with a trade secret, right, there's no registration, there's no expensive procedure, you don't have to get anybody's permission, you just have to have a commercially valuable idea and take reasonable steps. So think of like, for example, I like to get a snack before I give a class. And so I like to get these famous Amos cookies, you know, and the snack 
machine, vending machine. And think about it, right? The famous Amos uh, chocolate chip cookie recipe. That's a great idea of a trade secret, you know, little tiny cookies. Um, or another favorite product I like to use is the um, classic uh, original Tabasco sauce from Avery, Louisiana. Um, you know, that's, a, again, a family recipe, you know, a trade secret. Um, or think of a product that's very ubiquitous that we've all used at one point in time, the WD-40 oil. You know, again, that's a, uh, you know, trade that formula for WD-40 is a, another famous trade secret, right? And so um, now notice that reasonable efforts to keep your idea a secret. What that means in practice, you know, um, is that a judge basically wants to see, hey, I need to see maybe a non-disclosure agreement or, you know, a confidentiality clause and an employment agreement, you know, I need to see some, some evidence, some physical evidence that um, some steps that you took to keep your idea a secret, you know, and this, of course, is going to be very problematic for the Winklevoss twins, because not only are they dealing with a, you know, a college sophomore, Mark Zuckerberg, remember, Mark Zuckerberg is a self-described hacker, even to this day, right, the headquarters of Facebook are located on one hacker away, right, Menlo Park, so it's, um, you know, they're not going to have anything in writing, you know, um, so that's going to be, I think, a litigated issue had that case gone to trial, I think in favor of the Winklevoss twins, you know, um, they do have a sworn statement. I'll have to include it in the modules. Um, I forgot to include it from a Victor Gao, their previous computer programmer who went on to work for Google. That's why he left the Winklevoss twins. And he testifies that he gave Mark Zuckerberg the source code for Harvard Connection on the condition that he keep it a secret. So there will be at least a third uh, witness here that will testify, you know, that to some efforts that the Winklevoss twins to keep their idea a secret, but are those reasonable efforts? You know, uh, there's nothing in writing, you know, there's no contract, there's no non-disclosure agreement. A lot of times when you're an entrepreneur, it's very difficult to get people to sign those things, you know, um, uh, but you have to bear that in mind that uh, you do have to be able to prove that you took reasonable efforts, steps to keep your idea a secret. The other big risk factor with uh, trade secrets is the defense of reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is a defense to misappropriation of trade secrets. What that means is if you buy WD-40 and just open up the can and figure out yourself, you know, how to come up with a formula for such type of, uh, you know, uh, a, a grease product like that, or you open up a bottle of Tabasco sauce and you figure out how to make it, you know, on your own, um, or you, you know, figure out how to make your own famous Amos style cookies, that's perfectly fine. Or you figure out, you know, how to come up with your own website, social network, you know, reverse engineer your own uh, search rank algorithm. That's perfectly legal and perfectly fine. And so that's another possible defense that Zuckerberg might want to raise. You know, it's going to be tough, in my opinion, because he did see there's going to be testimony that he did see the uh, source code. But he might want to say, oh, no, you reverse engineered this. I came up with this on my own, you know, and that's going to be a perfectly legitimate defense, you know. Um, so uh, bear in mind, there's no such thing as a perfect method of protecting your idea. Patents, you know, only last for 20 years and are expensive and very difficult to get because you have to prove non-obviousness along with utility and novelty. Um, trade secrets, you know, there's no registration, so they're not as expensive to protect. But you run the risk of reverse engineering, right? And you run, you know, and yeah, and you do have to take reasonable efforts to keep your idea a secret. So you have to be able to prove that in court if you want to be able to protect your trade secrets. But that's how we basically protect an idea. Now, I will say, even if someone is able to reverse engineer your search engine algorithm, or they're able to reverse engineer your Tabasco sauce formula or your cookie recipe or whatever. That's why companies or your soda pop, you know, uh, uh, formula, that's why companies also invest a lot of money in trademarks. Because think about it, even if you can come up with the, with the, the Coca-Cola formula, right? Only Coca-Cola owns the Coca-Cola logo, right? And the word Coca-Cola and Coke, right? Same thing with Tabasco sauce, right? That very, uh, you know, you see that in all the restaurants, right? That diamond shaped looking um, uh, uh, label right? Or the WD-40 can, right? Very iconic, the blue, white, and yellow color scheme. The Google um, homepage, right? Um, 
the word Facebook, arguably, right? So the idea is anybody can come up with a social network, but if my company or I, the entrepreneur, own the rights to my trademark, only I can, you know, have the right to use this particular branding strategy. So trademarks are actually, I would argue, after coming up with a good idea for a product or service, you next have to come up with a way of branding your product and service. And that's what trademark law allows you to do. Now, here's the key thing with trademark law. In order to get a trademark, and by the way, you can trademark anything, not just a name like Coca-Cola or WD-40 or Tabasco. You can also um, trademark uh, the, the, what's called trademark dress, the way your packaging looks. You can trademark a color. Think of the UPS truck. The, that UPS shade of brown is actually trademarked. So no other delivery van company can use that shade of color. Um, the famous uh, Christian Louis Vuitton red bottom shoe, that particular shade of red is also trademarked. So no other company can use that shade of red on the bottom, on the soles of their shoes. Um, you can trademark a logo. The Nike Swish is, of course, probably the one of the most famous, right? And then, of course, you can trademark a word like Google or arguably Facebook, things like that. So uh, if, uh, trademark law is very, very versatile. In fact, you can even trademark a phrase. Marshawn Lynch, back in the day when the, he was with the Seahawks and they were went to their first Super Bowl, he famously said on Media Day, I'm just here so <laughs> I don't, don't want to be fined. He trademarked that phrase. You know, uh, I'm just here because I don't want to be fined. It's a great phrase on beast mode and all the other stuff that he came up with. A lot of athletes do this stuff, you know. And the thing about a trademark is um, it's originally based on common law rights. As long as you used a, this is the key, it has to be distinct. As long as your mark is distinct, and we'll see what that means in a moment, you automatically have those common law trademark rights. However, there's also a federal trademark law, and there's something called the United States Patent and Trademark Office, that you have the option of registering your trademark as well. And so, uh, you know, at the federal level. So that's the big difference. Sometimes you'll see um, a logo or a word with the words TM, and sometimes you'll see a logo, a word or whatever, with an R in a circle. If it's an R in a circle, it means it's a registered trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. If it's just a TM or a TM in a circle, that means it's an unregistered trademark, but there are common law rights associated with this. Now, whether you wanna get an unregistered trademark um, you know, or a registered trademark, here is the key. You have to be doing business. You have to be in commerce. This is not like a trade secret or a patent where you can have an idea but you're not yet ready to launch your idea or start up your business, right? Um, like the PageRank algorithm, this was an idea that Larry Page and Sergey Brin formulated as computer science students at Stanford. And then later when they fixed their, figured out their idea and perfected it, later they went into business. In order to get a tra uh, trademark protection, you have to be in business um, or about to go into business business within 180 days if you're doing a what's called in um, uh, an anticipatory uh, registration or a pending uh, registration but the, the, but that's that, that, that's a very important uh, important factor now um how do you get a trademark right so you have to be you know you have to be you know whatever that trademark is describing it could be a you know physical goods or services right you have to be selling or providing those goods and services on the market um, and your trademark has to be distinct. Now, what trademark law has done is created degrees of distinction, like I like to call it. So, um, for example, uh, the classic trademark where you get automatic trademark protection, as long as you're, you know, in commerce, is going to be what's called arbitrary and fanciful marks. And here I like to use, go back to the example of Google, you know, go back to 1998 when they founded uh, their company. Google is a completely arbitrary and fanciful word. You know, before the company existed, there was no word Google. There was a, there is a mathematical concept called a Google. It's spelled differently, G-O-O-G-O-L, which is a one with a thousand zero, something like that. Um, but the word Google spelled capital G-O-O-G-L-E, right? completely arbitrary and fanciful. Think of how many famous trademarks are like that. Chevrolet, um, Exxon, 
uh, Kodak, you know, the, the old photography company. Uh, it could go on Uber, you know? Uh, so if your mark is di distinct by being completely arbitrary, um, by the way, let me show you probably the most famous example of an arbitrary and fanciful trademark. I'll show you the registration for it. Um, let me go to screen share again. And uh, again, you'll find this in the modules. And let me just uh, click into there. And uh, let's see here. Um, here's Apple's first trademark registration. And, um, you know, it's the same, it's the same exact, um, you know, that's the same exact logo they use today, all these years later, right? Over 42 years later, you know, uh, when they received, or, you know, March 6, 1979, almost to the day, you know, and this is their trademark, federal trademark registration. The advantage of trademark registration, as opposed to just going unregistered common law, is that trademark registration even if you're only doing business in one market, let's say Orlando, Florida, or let's say you're Mark Zuckerberg, you're doing your Facebook only in a few select schools. Once, if you do a federal registration, you get automatic nationwide protection, even in those states and even in those markets in which you're not doing business. But you have to be doing business in at least one market, right? So that's one of the advantages of a federal registration, that you get this nationwide protection. Your mark now, you own it, as, as to the whole country, not just in those markets in which you're doing business. But you can see that uh, it's, pretty, it, it's pretty cool. Um, and there's more about trademarks you know, in the materials that I provided. Now, um, uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is so arbitrary and fanciful. An Apple logo and the word Apple to describe personal computers and now iPhones, right? Um, and iPads, completely arbitrary, completely fanciful, right? The next level of distinction is called suggestive marks. Actually, a lot of trademarks fall in the suggestive category. I'll give you some examples. Um, copper tone, skincare products, you know, uh, tanning lotion, right? Uh, copper tone, so the color of your skin, it, you know, after if you use these lotions uh, out, get a suntan. Or think of Netflix, right? Uh, it's suggestive of movies, a streaming a movie service. Um, so a lot of uh, trademarks. Uh, uh, could Facebook be suggestive as well? Possibly, you know? And so um, it's uh, suggestive is, there's still some level of creativity, but, you know, uh, it, it conjures up, uh, the suggestive mark conjures up the product or service that it's describing but it's doing so in a, a, a very uh, creative and original way. Uh, so, um, so a lot of marks are suggestive. The main thing is that if your mark is suggestive or you know, arbitrary and fanciful, you're gonna get trademark protection. And that's why when you register, that's what the United States Patent and Trademark Office has to determine. Is your, are you the first to register your trademark for those category of goods uh, that you're describing? And um, you know, is it distinct? by falling into one of these categories. The other two categories of trademark um, distinction generally do not receive protection. One is so-called descriptive marks. That is to say, marks that simply describe the product or service. But there's an important exception that a lot of companies use. And that is what's called the doctrine of secondary meaning. This is a common law doctrine, but it's incorporated in federal trademark law. That is to say, if you can show that your product has a secondary, your, your trademark has a secondary meaning in the mind of consumers, then courts will still protect it, even though it's just descriptive. A good example here would be American Airlines, right? American Airlines literally means, a, you know, an aviation, commercial aviation, you know, that's based in North America, United States, right? But when people, consumers think of American Airlines, we're thinking of the, the American Airlines with the silver fuselage and the red, white, and blue color scheme, you know, or think of Southwest Airlines, right? Literally, it's an airline based in Arizona in the Southwest. But now, of course, when people hear the word Southwest Airlines, we think of the fame, the Southwest Airlines. 
Facebook, I would actually argue, originally was probably just a descriptive mark. Because if you read the article in the Harvard Crimson, you'll see that Harvard already had a bunch of Facebooks. Each residential college had its own electronic Facebook, and the university was working on a universal Facebook, right? So um, I, I'm a little bit torn as to whether Facebook is suggestive or descriptive, because if you go to the original um, Facebook homepage, you'll see it's called the, the Facebook, one word, in brackets. And so, um, you know, that might be a little bit more suggestive. Once Zuckerberg decides to drop the the and call it Facebook, right? And all of these colleges already have Facebooks, you know, the traditional style Facebooks. Um, maybe there we got to go with secondary meaning that now people, when they think of the word Facebook, they're thinking or they hear the word Facebook, they're thinking of Zuckerberg social network site. Finally, there are generic marks. You simply cannot use words that are in the dictionary to describe a product, right? You can't use the word chair to describe your chair, right? Um, you either have to have some kind of arbitrary and fanciful, you have to have a different way of describing your product and service um, or something with a secondary meaning if you're gonna go descriptive. The interesting thing with generic uh, marks is that famous trademarks like the word Kleenex, Frisbee, um, aspirin, all those were originally uh, pro proprietary brands. Um, Google arguably is becoming generic in that people use the word Google to refer to any type of internet search, whether they're using the search, uh, the Google platform or Bing or DuckDuckGo or some other platform, you know? So it's on the level. And that's why um, the next area of law is going to be important because even if you lose trademark protection, right? Because your mark is now so famous that it's become generic, you know? Um, you can use copyright law to protect the expression of your ideas or the way your ideas uh, look. Um, now, here's the key with copyright law. Copyright law, again, there's, it's common law originally speaking. So there's only two requirements for a copyright. Do you have something original? you know, an original expression of an idea. Uh, you're not just copying someone else's or something transformative. Um, and number two, can the expression of that idea, of your idea, can it be affixed on a tangible medium? By the way, these requirements are, are now in the federal copyright statute of 1976, that you have to have, you know, your idea has to be original, and um, or somehow transformative, building on the work of others. And you have to be able to, when I say affixed in a tangible medium, um, you know, I mean, basically, can you print it, write it, record it, you know, uh, 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 draw it, et cetera? You know, can you affix it, you know, on, on, on a piece of paper or on some other you know, tangible medium? And so um, the thing about, um, uh, and again, even if you don't register, you have automatic copy, you know, common law copyright in anything you create. And I'll give you an example. The moment you take a selfie, that is your copyright. Um, the moment you write uh, an essay or a poem or a love note or whatever, that is your copyright. You own that, you know? And um, now there are some advantages to federal registration. It's very similar to trademark registration, although, um, copyright registration is done through the Library of Congress, and there's a form you can go online. I think it's a $25 fee. All you have to do is just fill out the form. It's a one-page form. Pay the fee and submit uh, a copy of your original idea, of your expression of your idea. And um, the, I, the thing here is that um, with registration, again, you get nationwide protection of your copyright. Also, the other advantage of um, registration, this goes for trademark law, you can go into any federal court in the country and protect your trademark and copyrights if they're registered. If they're not, you're going to have to go to state court, you know, and you're going to have to go to a state court in which the infringement is occurring. You know, it has to be some connection there. Uh, but with federal registration, you can go to any federal court. And the third advantage of registration, especially with copyrights, is there's something called statutory damages. This is just a fancy word for 
normally at common law, like we saw in the previous module, when you want to argue fraud, you not only have to prove the elements of fraud, you have to show how what your damages are. Or if you want to show like Paul's graph, you know, um, you were harmed, you know, you have to show that there's a connection to you, you know, the harm and the damages. But with copyright registration, we courts will just presume that, that connection, the infringement causes harm. And if you want, there's a schedule of statutory damages. There's a schedule of damages in the copyright statute that provide you, you know, a monetary compensation for every single act of infringement. And it's based on what the statute provides. And so now if your damages are greater than that, you're welcome to prove that in court but you don't have to do that. You don't have to go to that time and expense. So it makes it easier to prove your case, you know, because the, the law will actually award you damages without re requiring you to prove what your damages are, which is normally what you have to do at common law. So registration actually is a very big advantage, um, you know, from a practical point of view, if you're going to commercialize the expression of your idea. But that's the key thing. Copyright doesn't protect your idea the way trade secrets and um, uh, patents do. And copyrights are not really meant to, you know, brand. Uh, that's what trademark is for. But copyrights do protect the expression of your idea. The other advantage of copyrights is that if it's if it's owned by an individual, it's the copyright will last the lifetime of the author plus seventy years. Um, if the copyright is owned by a business, it's going to last for ninety five years. Now, the probably the most famous copyright that's owned by a business is going to be the Mickey Mouse owned by Disney, right? Uh, that was created by Walt Disney. You know, this is his claim to fame. Um, in 1928, the famous Steamboat Willie, the now famous Steamboat Willie cartoon, launching an empire. Um, and Walt Disney has to be one of the great businessmen of all time. You know, um, what, what an amazing imagination. Um, but here's the thing about it, right? That copyright is going to expire now in 2023, right? But guess what? Disney, the modern you know, corporation, they've also trademarked the, the, the Mickey Mouse you know, uh, logo. And the thing is, as long as they're using that Mickey Mouse logo to sell merchandise or to you know, brand their theme park experience, they can continue. That's the thing with trademarks. Trademarks, although they only last for 10 years if they're registered, you can renew your trademarks indefinitely every 10 years as long as you continue to be using uh, it in business, in commerce. So there's different ways of protecting your ideas, the branding of your ideas and the expression of your ideas, right? And that's what I wanted to get across in this class. The big ways are patent law, um, although that's very expensive and cumbersome, you know, that's not the most common way. The most common way are the other three ways, trade secret law, um, trademark law and copyright law. Now I want to do a quick time check and I want to talk about two subsidiary topics that with the honor sections I'll talk in more detail in later classes, but I want to introduce here, especially for the benefit of the students in the survey class as I'm going to make this video available. So I just want to, uh, if you'll indulge me for just a moment, I want to talk about the fair use defense and I want to talk about something called the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, one way of looking at this is ask yourself, um, how is YouTube any different from Napster? Napster is a really important case study in you know, business law because Napster is an example, a rare example in a capitalist, you know, free market, you know, a system in which the courts basically say, you know what, your entire business model is illegal and we're going to shut you down. You know, we're, we're going to effectively issue what courts call an injunction, basically prohibiting you from sharing peer to peer, you know, uh, uh, peer to peer file sharing. But when you think about it, right, isn't that what YouTube is all about? How is YouTube from a technical standpoint any different than Napster, except that, you know, Napster was audio MP3 files and YouTube is video MP4 files, right? And I'm going to tell you the main difference is going to have to be, one way of looking at it is going to be, you know, you could argue fair use, the fair use doctrine. But I'm going to tell you right now that that's not the main difference between Napster and YouTube. Um, I do want to say a few words about fair use, just again, for the benefit of my survey class, I'll go more into this uh, later with the honors section. Um, and fair use, the main thing you need to know about fair use 
is that it is a general standard. It's not a bright line rule. Fair use consists of four vague factors. And so um, um, the main thing I want you to know about fair use is that, you know, even copyrights, even property rights are never absolute. Think of property owners in real life. You own your land. But you can't prevent, you know, an airplane from flying over your land. You know, you don't have your rights are limited to some extent because, you know, uh, of the needs of commercial aviation. Now, drones, how do they fit in? That's something that's work that, you know, common law is working out as we speak. Or the FAA, I believe, is also getting involved in issuing a set of regulations. But in the domain of copyright, you know, sometimes you're allowed to steal, just to put it bluntly, right? And that's what the fair use doctrine is. And I will admit, I'm the number one offender. You know, I like to play music at the start of class. I like to show film clips, stuff like that, you know? In the fair use, there are these four factors, basically. One of the factors is um, what is the purpose of the copying, you know? Um, why are you stealing someone else's work? So if you're doing it like Saturday Night Live to do a parody, or if you're doing it like the New York Times to report the news, or if you're doing it like the professor for reportedly educational purposes, right? That's only one of the four factors. Even if you buy that, you know, my playing Will Smith has anything to do with any educational purposes, right? Um, um, which is a big if, there's still three other factors. The other factor is how much of the work have you stolen or have you copied? In my case, I played the entire song, you know? So it's looking pretty bad for me, you know? There's a third factor. The third factor is, okay, what is the nature of the work that you've stolen or copied? Um, you know, is it commercial in nature or was it really meant to be shared? In my case, you know, it's, you know, we're talking about, you know, this stuff is, uh, you know, licensed via Spotify. You know, Spotify has to pay royalties to the uh, owner of uh, Will Smith's music, you know, the big record labels. So it's definitely a commercial work. So those are three strikes against me. Um, there's a fourth factor, you know, the fourth factor is what is the effect of, you know, your, the infringement or what is the effect of your copying or your theft on the market for the copyrighted work? And so here the courts are, I think, very pragmatic. Like if my borrowing the work or stealing the work helps expand the market for that work, if now more people are likely to go out and buy Will Smith's music or go and listen to him on Spotify, which will then trigger Spotify having to pay royalties to Will Smith's, you know, whoever owns the rights to his music, then, you know, I could probably get out of it. One of the difficulties of the fair, of the fair use test, though, the fair use doctrine, oh, it's a common law doctrine that Congress codified when they enacted the copyright law. Um, one of the main, to me, one of the main frustrations is that um, the courts don't really weigh the factors. They don't really tell us which is the most important factor. In my experience, that fourth factor is really important, you know, but um, each court, you know, has sort of a different way of weighing and looking at it, you know, and uh, applying the fair use defense. Now, there's other things, you know, things are in the public domain, that's okay as well. But what I want to talk about, though, I want to answer, I want to end this lecture by answering that question I just posed. How is Napster any different from YouTube? Like, why is YouTube, you know, this big successful business, you know what I mean? That's now owned by Google Alphabet Inc., whereas Napster was completely shut down, you know, by the courts, you know, when their business models are basically indistinguishable. Well, I'll tell you the answer to that question is the, um, it's a law Congress enacted again in 1998. So I played music from that era. Not only was Google created in 1998, uh, formally launched, but also um, that was the year that Congress enacted something called the DMCA, which stands for Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. This is a really important law, and it answers the question why YouTube is in business while Napster was shut down. The DMCA does three things. Number one, it says copyright law applies to the internet. You know, if you basically, unless you can assert a fair use defense, you know, but that's four factors and those, and those you know, not clear how that can come out. You know, but um, internet uh, copyright law, and one would argue by implication, trademark law, patent law, you know, trade secret law, all, you know, property rights do extend to the internet. Um, but then with the copyright law, uh, the DMCA does, it does something really interesting. I'd like to summarize it this way. It creates a copy, it creates a balance, a compromise. It says, however, 
it's going to be up to the copyright owners, the big Hollywood movie studios, the big TV production studios, the big record labels. They're the ones that are going to have to go out and enforce their copyright violations on the internet. How? by sending in order to sue for copyright infringement via the internet. It's up now under the DMCA, it's up to the copyright owner to send what's called a notice and take down or take down notice to the infringer and give the infringer then a reasonable opportunity right to comply with copyright law. If, in other words, the DMCA creates a safe harbor, right? Before you can be sued for copyright infringement, um, on the internet, right? You have to be given a takedown notice, right? Now there are some, you know, exceptions if they can't find you this and that, you know. Uh, but the main difference between Napster and Google uh, and YouTube is this: when Napster received a takedown notice from Dr. Dre, who was one of the first people to sue Napster, when Napster refused a uh, re received a takedown notice from Metallica, who was one of the also one of the first uh, musician musical acts to sue Napster. When Napster got the takedown notice from the Recording Industry Association of America that represents like 95% of all composers and musicians, Napster basically ignored the takedown notice. They did nothing to try to comply with the DMCA. YouTube, on the other hand, right? When they get a takedown notice, they'll take the stuff down. You know, in fact, sometimes YouTube won't even wait to get a takedown notice, right? So YouTube has its own algorithms and sometimes they'll take, they'll flag things and they'll take down things on their own initiative. But, and one of the cool things I will say about Google, by the way, as sort of a footnote is that if you do go to Google and you see, you know, that it's been taken down, there will be a link and it'll actually take you to the takedown notice that Google received or YouTube received. And then you can do your further investigation. Now I can't say more about that. There's some more uh, complex aspects about this, but the reason why this is important is because from a practical point of view, it's now up to the entertainment industry to basically hire their own army of, you know, internet infringement, you know, search crews, you know, they're going to have to scour all of the internet, you know, on a daily basis and send down these cumbersome takedown notices before they can sue, right? You know, and so um, this is why there's something called um, the Stop Online Piracy Act that the entertainment industry is behind. They would like that, you know, to get rid of the takedown notice requirement, get rid of the safe harbor, you know what I mean? And Congress came very close to enacting the SOPA or Stop Online Piracy Act a few years ago. You may recall there was a day, I think it was January 24th, uh, 2015, if I'm not mistaken, where like the Wikipedia went offline for an entire 24 hour period. And there was a big Google, they distorted their Google trademark, you know, they put a big black censorship tape on it, you know, to protest the Stop Online Piracy Act. So you have to watch your congressmen and congresswomen, you know, because uh, this bill is floating out there in Congress. And, you know, uh, you know, if you want a free internet, you probably are worried about this bill. So the under the DMCA, you do have this kind of compromise situation where yes, copyright law does apply to the internet, um, uh, but, but in order to enforce your copyrights on the internet, the owner has to do the search you know, figure out who's infringing my copyrights, you know, and then has to send out a takeout, a takedown notice before they can sue to enforce. So it's a really important, you know, modification of copyright law for the internet era, for the internet age. Um, will the law be revised? Um, there's also a section 230 of the Communications and Decency Act, also providing certain um, immunities for defamatory statements, you know, all this it's like I say, you know, Congress is considering, right? There are calls for repealing or modifying Section 230, repealing or modifying the DCMA. Um, so you have to keep a close eye, you know, on, on Congress um, because, you know, the, 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 these things are in, the, are in the works. All right, let me go into the uh, chats here. Um, and, um, um, and yeah, and so the idea of songs here is a really great comment here from Ryan, right? Songs that, um, you know, are based on previous songs. One of the most famous copyright cases is a case um, involving two live crew. You know, today we take it for advantage. You know, we listen to a lot of hip hop music, and a lot of other music. And, 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 and by the way, don't get me wrong. I'm probably a one of the number one fans of, you know, I love Yo Gotti, for example, his LeBron James song. Um, you know, I love hip hop. 
Um, but you know, like hip hop today, a lot of bad words and things like that, uh, a lot of innuendo. Um, and one time, uh, Two Live Crew had a famous song uh, based on a Roy Orbison song, um, taking a little bit of the melody, uh, Pretty Woman. And so the idea was, is, you know, they didn't have the authorization from the record label that owned the rights to Ray Orbin, Orbison's uh, Pretty Woman song. And so um, that record label sued the group to live crew. And this case went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. I might just include it in the modules if anybody's curious about it. Uh, but what's really interesting about the case, it's, one of, it's probably the most important fair use case um, involving the first factor. That is, what is the purpose of your use? Notice that two live crew, they couldn't say that they using the melody for uh, Ray Orbison's Pretty Woman song, they couldn't say this was educational, right? Because they're out there, they're just musicians, you know, they're there to, you know, share their music and make money, go to do concerts, you know, attract fans. Um, they can't say that they're reporting news, right? They could argue that they're doing a parody um, in that, you know, they're taking a Roy, they're taking a classic song and then transforming it to kind of hip hop rap song. Um, but the problem is, you know, um, they're taking probably the most famous melody from that. Um, and they're taking something that's commercial in nature. And it's not clear, are they expanding the market for the Pretty Woman song, you know, or diminishing that market? And so what ended up, the Supreme Court ended up creating this new test called the transformative test, you know, that if you can take something and build on it and transform it and taking a classic rock song or, you know, a 1950s, you know, song and transforming it to a rap song, you know, the Supreme Court said, you know, that's sufficiently transformative, you know, uh, that we're going to say that, you know what, this is fair use. Um, and so uh, that's really one of the most important um, uh, um, developments, you know, um, in fair use doctrine, you know, notice common laws, the courts coming in and clarifying what's fair use. Thing about it, though, is what is transformative, you know, how transformative, you know, does it have to be in order to be uh, labeled as transformative, you know, those questions are still very close calls. Um, I myself have a paper, I may include it in the modules as well, called um, Literary Fan Art, where, um, for example, think of Star Wars, um, that's now owned, the Star Wars franchise is now owned by Disney, you know, the, um, George Lucas has sold his rights to uh, Lucasfilm, sold it to Disney. But think about Star Wars, this is a huge uh, fan universe here, fan fiction. Um, you know, where fans have created their own Star Wars characters, their own stories and things like that. And, you know, arguably that could be considered transformative under the Two Life Crew case, you know what I'm saying? But Disney is very aggressive in enforcing their property rights here, you know, and actually they shut down the entire, fan, my understanding, the entire fan universe. This is an ongoing controversy. There's even been a couple of cases and things like that that are uh, in the in the works. Um, I could say more about that in a you know in a different setting, uh, but for now, what I want to do is um, wrap this up with a few observations and then move to question and answer. I just want to wrap this up. Remember, this is just a big picture. What I'm calling the law of ideas. I call intellectual property rights the law of ideas because every product, every service, like if you watch the show Shark Tank. Everything, right? Everything that can be sold or offered, you know, on the internet basically embodies a set of ideas. And we go back to what Peter Thiel says, why he invested in Facebook is it's not just that Mark Zuckerberg had a great idea for a social network website to bring in back then college students closer together, right? It's that Mark Zuckerberg owned the rights to those ideas. Right. Although there was some question, did he steal some of the source code? But putting that to one side, he basically right. Uh, the Facebook was his copyright, his common law copyright. Um, he will eventually go on to trademark Facebook and the like symbol and all those other aspects of the Facebook logo, you know, et cetera. Um, now, of course, Instagram. Um, and that's um, um, and then that's the other third thing, you know, there's there are really three ways of protecting your ideas, you know, um, or the expression of your ideas or the branding and marketing of your ideas. Right. The classic ways are patents or trade secrets. Right. When it comes to the ideas themselves. Um, and also you have um, when it comes to the branding or marketing of your products and services, um, we have trademark law that protects distinct forms of marks um, and uh, copyrights that protect the expression 
of your ideas. And generally speaking, you take any product, whether it be or any service, whether it be the Facebook platform, the original 2004 platform or Facebook today, or whether it's a bottle of Tabasco sauce or a bottle of Coca-Cola, or whether it's the Google search rank, a search rank algorithm, what you're going to see, basically any successful company, is that they protect their ideas and expression of their ideas and branding of their ideas using one or more, usually more of all of these forms of law. You know, they'll protect the brand through the trademark. They'll protect the look of the brand, maybe through copyright. They'll protect the idea itself, either through patent law or trade secret law or some combination thereof. You know, there's no one right formula. What's cool about the law of ideas is that it gives entrepreneurs and, you know, business firms of all sizes, right, the tools with which to protect its ideas and branding of ideas and expression of ideas. So, so actually, to me, it is, you know, once we cover all the background stuff, which is the Constitution, which establishes the rules of the game, right, the government and basic rights, once we look at, let's say, criminal law and the main sources of law, and we look at you know common law tradition, which is the framework of property, contracts, and torts or injuries. Um, law of ideas is the most important area of business law, really. You know what I mean? Once we go beyond contracts and general property, et cetera. Um, and what's really cool about the law of ideas is that it actually embodies all the main sources of law, including the Constitution. The Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, authorizes Congress. I forgot to mention this at the beginning, so I'll mention it now. It authorizes Congress to protect, um, you know, the useful arts and sciences. And so that's why Congress has protected copyrights, trademarks, and patents. Um, also, um, under federal law, right, you see there's trademark law and copyright law and patent law. But also under common law, we have trade secrets, uh, which is still common law. And also, um, copyrights and trade secrets originated in common law, and there's still common law protections available, even when you don't register your trademarks and copyrights. And finally, international law, there is, I'm not going to go into any detail, I don't expect you to know this, but the World Trade Organization has something called these harmonization principles, that in order to become a member of the World Trade Organization, your domestic IP law has to be broadly respectful of property rights, you know, with all the limiting exceptions like fair use, et cetera. And so um, uh, this is important rights why countries like Russia and China um, have a ways to go before they can become full members of the WTO. There's a burn convention, there are IP laws in this area international. Um, but uh, we don't need to go into that just to, just to accept to remark that there are also international norms and treaties and uh, harmonization principles at the at the World Trade Organization level. So it, IP law also helps to illustrate all the main sources of law uh, as well as common law as well. So great, I'm gonna conclude there. So I'm gonna uh, stop this recording and um,